Um, I, I, I'm going to I'm going to actually start by also thanking um, the team that is behind uh, the PFM solution. Uh, so I am very clearly not alone. Uh, you'll see their smiling faces here towards the end of the of the presentation. But Avishek, Pramod, David, David, Cormac, Shagufta, like there's a whole team um, that is obviously very very pertinent. Uh, very, very important part of this. And so I just happen to be representing uh, a very uh, collective effort. Uh, and Paul, between you and Armin and Chen and John and just like everybody associated with uh, the global connection here, again, a big, a big shout out. And I also want to just switch a little bit and, and, and say both hello and thank you to our client partners, our, our, our various partners that are with us along the way. We do this obviously with you, for you, uh, and we couldn't in any way do it uh, without the uh, ability to, uh, I'm going to call it co-develop what is obviously happening here. Um, and that indeed is the purpose of, of my presentation here, here today. Um, I happen to be one of the partners in the Canadian firm, and I'm also uh, our global leader for uh, public finance management, which is essentially all things public budgeting. Uh, and public budgeting is really at the core of what governments do. Uh, and so um, we're very proud. And I know that about two, two years ago, I think we introduced the concept. And now I'm very proud to be able to share uh, some of the working applications of, of what we have both invented and developed and are now you know, properly implementing uh, associated with, with the public finance manager's solution. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll say a little bit more about PFM. I'll say a little bit about the early applications uh, and a little bit about what's next. Uh, and then we'll open it up for some questions. And on the question uh, uh, panel in, includes Abhishek Sinha, uh, who is a partner of mine here in Toronto, but also the global leader uh, from the technology side for, for the PFM solution. So let me just give you the introduction to the actual solution itself and why and why it exists. And again, I said at the beginning that this is essentially around public budgeting. Uh, and when you think literally about the trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars that are spent by governments around the world, they do all of that through public budgets. They set all of their priorities, they deal with all of the legal appropriations and they discharge all of the services uh, that we as citizens around the world uh, benefit from through public budgets. Uh, and yet there is an ongoing challenge that has existed from time immemorial uh, that today is only just in the early stages of being, of being addressed. And that is essentially that I have a very, very difficult time in one frame, in one integrated platform to be able to understand what I spend public money on, how I spend it, and why I'm spending it, which is essentially what do I deliver as a result? It is about the outputs, the outcomes, the impact that governments are trying to have within society. Uh, and that is essentially what the core of government act activity is. And the reason why it's so difficult to understand what, how, and why in, in, in one frame uh, has to do in fact with the complexity of government itself. Multi-organizational delivery systems increasingly relying on delivery agents that actually exist outside of government control. And again, I sit here in Toronto, which is in the province of Ontario, which is one of the largest sub-sovereign uh, jur jurisdictions in the world, spending something in the order of about $165 billion. And I'm not sure that everybody understands just how broad the delivery systems are more than 90% of that money is spent by entities that are outside of government's control. And when they're outside of government's control, they're also outside of our ability to manage. They're outside of our ability, at least easily, to do financial reporting, to do the sort of performance reporting and so on that we actually wanna to get to, to make sure that we've got efficient and effective allocation of taxpayer and other forms of public resource. The second issue is that I've got limited capability to integrate financial and non-financial information. I spend money, financial, for a purpose. 
non-financial. And whether that's regulation, whether that's direct service delivery, whether that's healthier citizens, I am spending money with a purpose. And ultimately to understand if I'm spending it well, and if I'm getting the results that I want, I have to integrate the financial with the non-financial. Again, today's information management systems are not fully capable of being able to address that. And so we are left in a situation where we've got suboptimal decision-making cap capability. Then the third component of that is that it is costly to try and reconcile these different views. And of course, as we, and if some of the true believers, if you will, associated with blockchain know, is that when you've got situations that start to look like that, and again, this is at the heart of everything that government does, it is actually, we think, a challenge, and we're starting to prove now in serious depth uh, that blockchain, and in particular the PFM blockchain, our public finance manager, uh, is in fact a potential uh, attribute and uh, uh, solution to go ahead and help, help with that. So where does it fit? Again, I think you'll probably see components of this throughout, throughout the conference. Uh, it fits within uh, the EY ops chain. Uh, it's obviously can be connected to the blockchain analyzer as Paul has, has just said. And essentially it is part of the commitment that we have uh, in, into the community to make sure that what we are developing and what we are applying is as integrated as it can be and it is as positively reinforcing. So here's just another kind of stylized view. And essentially what I do is I've got central finance, I've got people who manage the execution, and then I've got ultimately the recipients, the delivery agents and the people who are, who are beneficial. Really simple view here is about essentially connecting. And the PFM blockchain solution connects various components. And so let us talk about a couple of the applications. So I'm going to talk to you about two applications. Uh, the first one is from the City of Toronto, and the second one is from the state of Western Australia. Uh, and they are both applications that are now into their stages of, of, of uh, actual working and, and, and on their way to full production. Uh, but they are both indicative of the type of power uh, that we're starting to see, the type of benefit that can be delivered into a public budgeting type scenario. So the first one is from the City of Toronto. They've got a very ambitious uh, government-wide financial management transformation going on, uh, essentially driven about effectiveness, about accountability, and, and, and about efficiency. And the first application that we've worked on them with is essentially around the provision of shared services. So they have a number of shared services, as you would imagine, very, very large government, very, very complicated government. Uh, and they've got two types of funding that they have to be able to reconcile. They've got tax-based funding and they've got rate-based funding. And those funding sources come with them different reporting, different operating ob obligations. And so that's one of the conditions that we're trying to address. The first application that we did was around fleet services. And fleet are, is just that, it's cars and trucks and other types of vehicles that are provided from an internal market provider to the other divisions, 44 divisions, many, many agencies in the, in, in the city of Toronto. And essentially what they've got is they, in, in the old world, they have a very difficult time reconciling that internal market. Uh, they've got lots of links between financial reporting. They've got lots of requirement to understand sort of the demand and the supply of those services and being able to then manage the fleet assets in as optimal a way as possible is a difficult thing to do in a non-blockchain world. And again, the reason is lots of organizational boundaries, lots of independent decisions, lots of different uh, sort of authorities and many different systems to try and organize across. And so what we've come in uh, and, and done is developed and applied uh, our PFM solution to be able to address those sorts of challenges. And the outcomes, here's sort of a stylized view, if you will, associated with the way that it actually works. But the outcomes, as you start to see there, emerge across the top, enhanced transparency, improved productivity, reduced reconciliation costs, and as a result of that, a, a much higher uh, level of, of, of visibility and a much stronger dimension for decision-making and management that is now available to, to, to the city. 
And the way that that actually is measured on a more specific basis essentially deals with uh, the reduction of lag times in the exchange of information, the reallocation of effort to, ad to, to administer that, essentially from you know, people spending much of their time in a, in, a, in a month down to essentially having to spend no time on that, allowing them to focus on the things that matter more, uh, and moving our informational basis for decision-making and management away from a very long historical view to one that is shared. So it's you know, same time, near to real time, but the same time view around the important the fleet managers, the service managers, and so forth, uh, as they actually come together. And again, what that allows us to do is in the classification, the reporting, so this is kind of a statutory obligation, I'm actually able to report and to deal with my rate-based, my tax-based ob obligations in a much more efficient and, and, and effective way. I can move from a nominal allocation to a very accurate allocation of those services and those costs. I can change the conversation amongst public managers, which then in fact enhances my capability through an enhanced ac accuracy in the sharing of information uh, to actually basically make better decisions and, be and through those better decisions, optimize the asset value, optimize the service value uh, and achieve what governments want. The second application that I'll share with you uh, is here from Western. It's a similar sort of thing, but now actually involves to involve entities that are external to the government, and that is government in, in Western Australia. Uh, and they have schools, they've got call centers, they've got maintenance contractors, they've got departments. Finance, they've got Department of Education and they've got Treasury. And each of these actors in their way has got in today's world kind of a separate responsibility, but they're trying to coordinate that responsibility together. And again, have limits in the ability to be able to do that and execute that uh, in today's cross organizational management, cross system management world. And the TFM solution that we've begun to implement there, of course, addresses that as, as, as a challenge. And so essentially what we've got, you've got the schools that are looking to request uh, uh, service. The call center kind of manages that. The maintenance contractors and so forth, again, ex ex external agents, they, they provide it. Department of Finance in the state of Western Australia does its, uh, does its uh, uh, job to administer all of this. Department of Education is kind of the accountable bu budget, and then Treasury is, is the central authority that, that goes into the uh, coordination of all of this. And here, what you see are a series of really easy and very legitimate questions to ask, sort of, you know, from the, from the one end, has the job been allocated? Have they started the job? How many jobs do I have? Am I gonna get paid on time and so on? Into the application of the actual uh, a, a public administration side of this, which is essentially, have I received the goods that I thought I was to the right standard? Am I willing to therefore pay for those? And have I allocated the right amount of budget, the right level of expectation against that? And then am I able, in fact, in some sense of same time or real time, am I able to make decisions about the efficiency and the effectiveness of that? And in the old world, the answer was really, really difficult. Again, long, long lag times, but even more than just the timing dimension, poor integrated information. And so when we get into the solution side of things, in fact, what you're finding is that moving to a single source of integrated financial and non-financial information, if I'm in treasury and I'm setting the overall budgets, I'm able to allocate those budgets very effectively and with greater purpose, with greater levels of transparency and with greater levels of accountability. If I'm in the middle of that chain, I'm able to do a better job at understanding how those monies are being spent, the efficiency and the effectiveness of those public taxpayer dollars being spent. And then if I'm in the delivery end of that system, I'm able to actually 
A, get paid more effectively. I'm able to understand the actual supply chain of that. Uh, and over time, uh, the entire system starts to gain efficiency. Uh, and again, we are able to measure that, of course, as you would expect us to, to, to be able to. Uh, and you get a serious uptick in every one of the sort of management and performance oriented uh, scenarios that you would expect, right? So same time accountability and, aud and auditability enhances public accountability and trust. Uh, great, great levels of efficiency in terms of administration. Uh, and I think the most important part of that is better decision. Okay, so there's a couple of the working examples uh, and hopefully that shares that there are some, you know, real life examples that are taking place out there. So let me just close with a little statement about what's next. Um, the reason why we have gone down the path of creating PFM and, and, and now applying it is essentially, again, that it fits right at the heart. And when people think about the way that governments work, it, it's actually, it can be simplified. It's essentially they do expenditure and revenue management, they do regulatory management, and they do direct and indirect service delivery to folks like you and I uh, in terms of our citizenry, but also to the many, many uh, business relationships that, that, that they have. And Toronto and Western Australia are only two examples of the way that PFM can sit essentially at the heart of being able to enhance our ability through better decision information, ultimately better decision making, to be able to support more effective expenditure management, revenue management, regulatory management, and service delivery. Uh, and that's why governments exist. That's why we provide service to governments. And the reason why we have, again, developed and, and, and are now applying the PFM blockchain solution is that it is, I, I, the proof is right there, uh, is, uh, significantly more effective at being able to address that core purpose. Uh, and we're about, we're, we're, we're doing it for Toronto, we've done it for WA, we're about to do it for a couple of, uh, of I'll just call them supranational or organizations based in Washington, D.C. So again, when we're here, hopefully in New York next, next year, um, we'll, we'll be able to share even more uh, powerful examples. The last thing I'll say, and again, it's kind of this connection to what we're all just living through here. Uh, COVID-19 is obviously, and this is in no way to make uh, in, 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 in any way light of the situation. It is a very, very serious thing, obviously. But beyond the health side, governments are responding essentially through their public budgets. And so all of the response, the restart, the recovery, the rebuilding, the support for resiliency, that is that, it, that the monies that are being spent by governments around the world are all essentially a condition of PFM, of public finance management. And all of that money essentially is being spent outside of government. And so as, you know, whatever it's going to be, a trillion or more dollars is spent in the United States, as an example, sooner or later, and I would suggest perhaps even sooner, there is going to need to be an accountability, a reconciliation, an ability to prove that those monies were spent effectively. And more than anything, that is an issue of what we think can be the PFM solution. So I will end there. Again, I will thank my colleagues. Uh, my, my, this, is, this is the inner core team, lots and lots of other people directly involved. Uh, but hopefully that gives you a little flavor of the way that our collective innovation in the blockchain space uh, can go to create very, very meaningful public value. Hey, Mark, this is Abhishek here. We've got some questions. We've got some questions on the on on the Q and A, and maybe um, you know, I'll read out the first question for you. Um, you know, how is a blockchain-based solution optimal for these use cases over a centralized system that is accessible to all PFM users and stakeholders? Hmm. 
Well, again, it goes it goes to uh, in part, and let me just answer it through the through the through the vision associated with. If I if I take the WA example, the the, the Western Australia example, there I've got really hard organizational boundaries, different authorities, different legal capabilities to act on behalf of the state government. That if if I were to try and centralize through one system and then connect that into the external service providers, I would essentially require them all to come onto a single system, all to come into a single authorizing and authority environment. Uh, and that would be, you could just imagine the level of complexity, the amount of time, the amount of investment and so on that would be required to go ahead and do that. Uh, and I don't wanna do that, and so I don't do that. And what I'm left with in today's environment is I've got to reconcile all of our exchanges. Uh, and in the blockchain world, of course, blockchain, as you know, Paul has said very, very eloquently and very, very powerfully, uh, is purpose built to be able to make those sorts of connections and to deal with those different authorizing environments, to deal with those different system environments, uh, and to do it very efficiently, very, very effectively. Uh, so that's, that's why we're doing it. It is a practical solution. It is a less expensive, so it's a lower uh, investment required to be able to address that. Uh, and by every, every estimate of, of, of result, it is a much more effective way of, of addressing those issues. Yeah, so um, the, the next question really asks, how does this work alongside existing government information systems in ERP? And maybe I'll, I'll take that one a little bit and, and build upon what you said, Mark, is that the idea of implementing one centralized system is sort of, as Paul said earlier in his, in his opening note, is that it creates this new centralized you know, authority and organization, which sort of takes the place of, you know, the other um, organizations that we may have. And it's a very dated way of, uh, of, of trying to connect organizations. And by uh, integrating with the existing ERPs, what we're able to do is actually take things that matter, things of value, whether it is information related to the programs or the conditions of spend, or the actual spend itself and, and tokenize them and represent them on the blockchain. So this doesn't start replacing any of the ERP systems. We don't want to do that uh, for a whole bunch of reasons, but it uh, creates a network across many ERP systems of different organizations who are involved in delivering that value. So yes, it absolutely works alongside existing information systems and ERPs. The next question we have um, is, how does your platform address the memory and computational scalability, as well as capacity throughout, through, capacity throughput limitations of current blockchains? And who mines or agrees consensus in these government networks? So that's a really interesting question. And, and you know, we need to sort of think of this in context of how government and government organizations are set up. Um, each organization um, in this value chain, in this ecosystem is set up with their own sort of sovereign authorities, which could be given to them through acts of parliament or other regulation or legislation. And we need to be able to mimic or represent the same set of authorities on the blockchain. And so what we use in, in all of these solutions is uh, proof of authority uh, consensus mechanisms to actually represent the same authorities which those organizations have within, um, within the real world. So I think that's it in terms of the questions. Oh, there's, there's another question which just came in. Um, what do you see as the PFM blockchain applicability for debt management and financing? And I think this is the last question that we'd be able to take. Uh, Mark, do you want to take this one? Uh, sure, ha happy to. Um, again, and it's, and it's just another form of expenditure. 
and another instrument through which governments budget and execute their priorities. Uh, so uh, it is it is it is entirely possible uh, to 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 think about structuring a PFM solution that would go to um, essentially being able to trace to be able to uh, manage the conditions of that either financing they may be project based they may be more program based if you're structuring you know uh, project finance and so forth that that is another one of the applications that we've actually got where you actually structure the conditions of the project finance, debtors, equity holders, government players, et cetera, supply chain and so forth. Uh, and all of those ob obligations that are tied to a particular project uh, can, can obviously be structured through a PFM type solution that we've, that we've just introduced. In the broader context, if you're doing it at say the state level or at the, or at the national level, uh, again, it is when you unpack it, it is essentially a series of individual contracts uh, and individual ob obligations uh, that we can tokenize, that we can write into smart contracts, that we can start to connect uh, between the debtor and the debtee, between government, between projects, et cetera. Uh, and essentially it's, uh, it's again, I mean, it's one of the applications, particularly at the project finance level um, that, that we're definitely working on. Uh, and at the national level, I think it's, I think it's gonna come in. In fact, maybe the last thing I would say is that you can see, you know, debt management, uh, more taxation management, and so on. These are going to be tied to the uh, digitalization of fiat currency, and I know that that's a major topic of conversation a little later on in the in the uh, conference. And so there's a way to kind of integrate those 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 two perspectives. Okay. Listen, again, thanks to everybody for participating and uh, fantastic questions. And anything else you might need, just please shout out and we'll, uh, we'll do our best to answer.